We read, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So again, we're introduced to Boaz in chapter 2. And as we focused on last class, names have power. So following suit, and as we left off last time, um, it was Isaiah 49, verse 5, strength, the Hebrew Oz, it's the root of Boaz. And some, like Brother Thomas, have found his name to mean strong one, or in him is strength. Which we have is a stark contrast uh, to the meaning of Ruth's first husband, Malon's name, uh, Sickly. Boaz is introduced as a mighty man of wealth. Um, in the first two verses of Isaiah 11, talk about uh, the branch, the Messiah, Christ. And we're familiar with it. It says, And there shall come forth the rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. So one who has might or strength, and that word might shares the same uh, root as, as mighty in Ruth 2. In Luke 2, verse 40, uh, we know the Lord Jesus growing up as a child waxed strong. In 2 Corinthians 8, it says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So like Christ, Boaz is this mighty man of wealth. And uh, further focusing kind of on this uh, character or attribute of his, mighty meaning strong or, or valiant. Isaiah 9, 6 uses the same, same Hebrew, says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And, and as we have a, a picture there um, on the right, and I've recently personally been looking it up a lot, it's very interesting I highly suggest, uh, I guess, any, any Bible students, any of us should look into these things. Um, winnowing, along with the kind of foregoing, reaping and threshing, all the work done uh, to draw out the grain is hard and laborious. It's, it's tedious work, right? Um, and especially back then, uh, without tools like, like combine tractors and things. Uh, and as we'll find in chapter 3, though he is this man of wealth and owns this field and has servants and young men and laborers and reapers, Boaz does his own work physically. Right? As, as verse 2 of chapter 3 says, winnowing his own barley. And we likewise uh, have example of the same in Christ, working hard. You can think of you know, the carnal things, uh, carpentry, building houses, uh, enduring pains and strains and coming to the cross and doing his own labor, though he's a master and Lord, yet washes he the disciples' feet, being made perfect by the things which he suffered. And as we read in Romans 8, verse 3, uh, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So it was weak, and by implication, he was strong. He's strong to this task. Ephesians 6.10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, uh, in Hebrews 2, um, talking of Christ, we read from verses 16 and 17. I've got on the screen here. For barely he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. So his brethren, the seed of Abraham, kind of think the, the family of Naomi, who are relatives with Boaz, as it says here um, in this first verse, a kinsman of her husband's. And we'll, and we'll note uh, first that, that kinsman here is, it's not the Goel, and, and Mansfield points this out, actually. Rather, it's the Hebrew uh, yada, to know or perceive. So it's like an acquaintance. Um, and the word has to do with one who is known 
with more of a visual observation. So we get the impression Naomi's not super close or familiar with this man, Boaz. She knows of him, as it were, which as we look at the promises, um, seeing the singular seed of far off, the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah, the, the shadows of the true image and not the very substance. And, and then secondly, we can see how it says here that Boaz is a Limelech's kin. Not Naomi's. He's of the family of Elimelech. And later elsewhere, um, in chapter 4 and verse 3, he refers to Elimelech uh, as his brother. And as we find, Christ is a brother of the kingdom of Israel, as Elimelech types. Just as we have Joseph, uh, brother to the 12 tribes of Israel, as God calls himself a father to Israel, uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 9, they are firstborn. And as it says here in Acts 7, 37, typing Christ, Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. Christ, is just as Boaz was, is of the, is of the family of Elimelech. So throughout the book of Ruth, um, in-laws are identified. You have the, the sister-in-laws uh, for, for Orpah and Ruth, mother-in-law with Naomi, daughter-in-law with Ruth. And, and even when people are referring to the relation, it'll say, thy sister-in-law, thy mother-in-law. But throughout the book, there's not a single occurrence where the mother-in-law or the daughter-in-law ever uh, directly address each other as such. We find in the last verse of, of, of the previous chapter, Ruth's called daughter-in-law uh, by Naomi. But now here in this second verse, Naomi directs her as my daughter. And then further, it's uh, in verse 22 of this same chapter, and it's a great example where, where the kind of the narrative identifies her as daughter-in-law. But Naomi says in the same verse, again, my daughter period. It's this very lovely um, term she has for her. So Ruth is this Gentile, and Naomi, like Sarah, has no children, yet adopts Ruth. She's, she does not address her as in-law, but as my daughter. And now uh, Ruth goes out to the field to glean. And we know it isn't just any field, but it's the emphatic, the field, uh, verses 2 and 3, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And Matthew 13 says that the field is the world in uh, Christ's parable of the tares. We find further in verse 3, it's Boaz's field specifically that she happens upon, that she encounters and comes to. And Romans 10, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. So she was not... Uh, specifically looking for this particular field of Boaz's. And this is really true when, when we hear stories of those from, from outside, as we say, that often they're not looking necessarily for Christ or his field, this hope of Israel, but inevitably they hap upon the truth in whatever way that is. And then they're there. They can't get away from it. It's the truth. And further, as we look at this with Ruth, the Gentile, these things may seem like uh, time and chance, but then retrospectively, we can see that the hand of Yahweh is at work, which uh, later down in chapter 2, at verse 20, when you kind of step back and read it, Naomi's actually giving Yahweh the credit for bringing Ruth uh, to meet Boaz. And, and other translations can make this a bit more clear, but blessed be he of Yahweh, who hath the who is Yahweh as he's the one who, 
who hasn't left off his kindness to the living and the dead. Naomi sees this providential hand bringing Ruth to Christ and, and his, his field specifically, uh, which is this, this field of Israel. And we just look at the fields, um, and especially as we come into chapter two, much of this allegory in Ruth has to do with farming, harvesting food. And uh, just play with some word searches and put this table together, kind of highlighting all the farming terms, if we can call it that. Um, my farming experience is limited, so could be missing something. But um, as you can see, the book is pretty heavily focused on this, especially within these, these first couple of chapters. Uh, Bethlehem, the house of bread, you know, bread is made of wheat. And Bethlehem indeed seemed to be a major uh, center for, for this wheat and barley growing. And the connections as we go through this with, with all the farming parables that we're familiar with that, that Christ gives in, in the New Testament are clearly relevant and, and should continue to kind of surface in our minds as we go through this. And so as far as the gleaning goes, uh, it was laid out in the law um, as a special arrangement to allow for it says they're the poor and the stranger to gather food. Leviticus 23, and when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am Yahweh your God. But we wanted to um, highlight uh, something that found in Expositor from HP. And if you look through Leviticus, the rest of Leviticus 23, it, it lays out a number of Israel's feast days in a specific order um, shown on the slide here. And, and Mansfield points out what they figure. And when you come down to gleaning, what we're focused on at the moment, where we kind of find ourselves in this grand scheme at the moment, that the gospel extended to Gentiles who are gleaning off the field of Israel and, and that hope of Israel. And it's kind of this interesting timeline built into Leviticus 23 by the Almighty, really um, solidifying how important this book of Ruth is. Uh, and for us to be looking at it and what it addresses is so applicable to what we're doing. So according to the law, um, it's found us in Deuteronomy uh, 24 as well, verse 19. This is a thou shalt command. And it goes on to say in Deuteronomy, a command of Yahweh. That the strangerless, fatherless, widow, all had um, pretty much rights by law to glean the fields. You can almost imagine uh, the world's use of the term, you know, entitled, strong arming what they desire. It's my right. But this is not the attitude uh, of the bride of Christ. And, and obviously it should not be ours. Ruth was all these things. She's a, she's a Moabite stranger. She's a widow of Malon. And through uh, the, sh the shedding of her nativity, going with Naomi and really um, disowning her family, she was fatherless and could have waved all of this bit of the law in the face. Deuteronomy 24 goes on even further, listing these same needy, strangerless, the, father, the fatherless, the widows, uh, and their special provisions that were, were, were put in place for them. But Ruth's attitude is humility. And in verse 2 of Ruth, the, the let me now, uh, it's not as we would understand it today, uh, not kind of like this bratty, let me have that. Rather, the Hebrew means I beseech, pray, to plead, um, which we find later in the chapter, same word in verse 7. She's actually asking the servants of Boaz, I pray you to let me glean. And further, uh, out of verse 2, she actually is seeking these things, as it says, by grace. And next, we're introduced to the reapers in verse 3. And from kind of chapter 1's last verse, we know it's harvest time when all this is taking place. So the reapers would be those who work the field, who kind of take in the harvest. And as we saw before, Ruth comes upon a part of the field belonging to Boaz. So this is Boaz's field uh, in type beginning at Israel. And John 4 uh, pretty clearly lays out who these reapers are. 
John 4, verse uh, 33, Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? And say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you're entered into their labors. So we, I sent you, the apostles, um, the disciples, to reap. So the reapers are like these disciples, the laborers of Christ, sent to gather out of Israel a harvest. That really culminates in Acts 2, where at Jerusalem during Pentecost, uh, the feast that's all kind of focused on harvest. Peter and the other apostles stand up in Jerusalem and they proclaim Christ. And they seek to bring to repentance men of Judea, men of Jerusalem, and men of Israel. And it says in, in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. I think even... Uh, some Bibles, you know, a little summary title things. They actually call this section in Acts 2 the ingathering. And further, and fairly uh, suitably, in verse 3 of Ruth, we have it highlighted that uh, Ruth gleans after the reapers. She followed after them. And just as we have in Scripture, further along in Acts, with, that, uh, with the apostle of the Gentiles, Paul. He's coming in immediately following this, this harvest of the disciples, the, the reapers of Israel, to the Jew first, as Paul himself says in Romans. And it's Acts 1, verse 8, that says, Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And you kind of get this uh, impression of a, of a prioritized list and this like radius that's centered at Jerusalem, but ultimately working outwards to the uttermost part of the earth. So Ruth's, you know, the Gentile brides, the ecclesias, our gleaning follows after the work of the apostles, their labors in the gospel harvest. And it was pointed out uh, during our discussions in our last class, um, how in verse 6 of chapter 1, Yahweh had visited his people uh, in giving them bread. And that being like Christ coming into the world as he is that bread of life. And, and out of Bethlehem, as we read here in verse 4, comes this strong man. Uh, Matthew 2, verse 6, uh, John 7, 42, the Messiah comes out of. He comes from Bethlehem. As we know, David did as we know the Lord Jesus does, and as we have here, Boaz came from Bethlehem, from the house of bread. And John 6, 33, very similar verbiage. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. For I came down from heaven, and not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So that bread, like the manna that came down from heaven, like the Christ that came from the house of bread. And just one more note uh, from this. Boaz is coming from Bethlehem. And we compare that with Elimelech, who um, in chapter 1 leaves Bethlehem and went to Moab because of the famine. You find it would appear that Boaz really never left but stayed in Bethlehem throughout that kind of physical famine. So Boaz is faithful to this house. He didn't leave when others like Elimelech did, who kind of bailed with the hard trials, who, again, look for that natural bread instead of holding to Bethlehem for the spiritual bread. And it was pointed out to me uh, recently that Elimelech's name is mentioned six times in Scripture, and they're all here um, in the book of Ruth. And... Uh, and with the significance of that number and who he figures, we have really Israel 
after the flesh, these that are after the natural, the, the satisfaction of bread, but are not after that heavenly bread. And that's in contrast with a man like Boaz and like Christ. And just one more final point uh, with these reapers. Uh, again, you can look at what it said here. It's quite specific what Boaz tells the reapers. He says, Yahweh be with you. While the reapers then tell Boaz, Yahweh bless thee. And for the figure, Christ tells his disciples in John 14, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Yahweh be with you, just as Boaz tells his reapers. And then further in Hebrews 2, points out Christ calls them brethren, just as we've seen Boaz willing to join these reapers as brethren in the actual work. Uh, Hebrews says, he will declare thy, Yahweh's name, unto those brethren. It's quoting Psalm 22. And as we see, it's the very first thing that Boaz does when meeting up with these reapers. Yahweh be with you. But surely even better than these is chapter 17 of John. It's Christ's uh, prayer to the Father for, for those that are his, for his disciples. And maybe best if we wanted to turn there. Um, John 17. We could almost put the whole chapter kind of as a cross-reference um, to this verse in Ruth. And we'll just pick out a few specifically. John 17 and verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were. And dropping to verse 9, I pray for them, for they are thine. Verse 11, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. 15, I pray that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Verse 19, again, that they also might be sanctified. Verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. And then verse 23, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them. And finally, I have verse 17, the last, uh, last verse of John 17 on the screen. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So it's this really amazingly uh, lovely chapter, the care Christ has for his disciples, really before his own life, the, the concern for Yahweh be with you. And um, you have this master of this field, the owner, his dealings with his laborers, his servants, how he talks to them. It's very Yahweh, Yahweh, back and forth. And it's all about uh, the Almighty's business. And Boaz is clearly coming from Bethlehem, joining them in this work. And then next we have the response of the reapers. Yahweh bless thee, Boaz. And really what the reapers are saying is this um, affirmation or recognition that Jesus is sent of God, blessed of Yahweh, that thou art the Christ. And again, John 17, uh, throughout it, we find ample. It's they have known, you have given me, we are one. Um, and the second to last verse of John 17, uh, we also have on the slide, says in the and these have known that thou hast sent me. There's this beautiful relationship between Christ and his reapers that we have laid out in the chapter. Now we come to verse 5. Uh, then said Boaz unto his servant, that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? So Boaz indeed does notice her. Right, is not being of his maidens that, that are usually gleaning there, as we find later in verse 8. Um, maybe as a Gentile, she stands apart, observed differently than Jewish. But as we find in 1 Peter 3, the godly bride, whose adorning is not that outward, seeks not to be noticed. 
Uh, yet still, Boaz does notice her, this, this meek and quiet girl. So then asks, whose damsel is this? Who does she belong to, really? Where is she, where is she from? And just as 1 Peter 3 later highlights in verse 6, whose daughters ye are, daughters of Sarah, daughters of that Abrahamic, this damsel is of Naomi, her daughter, as we already saw. But as a daughter, the damsel is shown in 1 Peter 3, she should be subject to a spiritual head, which is normally a husband or a father. So really the question Boaz is asking Whose is she? Whose Daniel, damsel is after the man? He that's spiritually responsible for her. Is she married to a husband already? Who's her father? Which the answer, of course, as we come into verse six, is she is not spoken for, other than the Naomi promises, the, the mother she's cleaved to. And it reminds us of the beginning of Romans seven. If if the husband be dead, she's loosed from the law. So verse 6, she came back with Naomi, uh, the answer to the previous question. And Mansfield points out um, this Moabitish, a better rendering is a Moabitish instead of the, as it really does lack that definite article, that, that ha in the Hebrew. And it shows, it shows that she's, um, she's just some Moabite and adds to the feeling, the, the opinion that the Israelites had toward them. We find this specific, um, specifically about the Moabites and Ammonites in Deuteronomy 23, um, verses 3 through 6. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh. Even to their tenth generation shall not they not enter into the congregation of Yahweh forever. Because they met you not with bread and water in the way when you came from out of, from, forth out of Egypt. And because they hired against the Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor, of Mesopotamia to curse thee. Nevertheless, Yahweh thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but Yahweh thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because Yahweh thy God loved thee. Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. So understandably so, they're put off by Moabites. And yet we find Ruth approaches by a different means and yields this different character, as we'll, we'll look at a little bit later. Uh, but even here, though, as Scripture points out, Ruth came out of Moab, just like the Gentile strangers that are called out of darkness. Verse 7, she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. And we kind of find this... Uh, persevering and steadfast character of Ruth in her labors you know, to reap. As we find similarly in Galatians 6, verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So Ruth continues leaning, as it says, through the day. Um, in Acts 14, Paul's preaching to Gentiles, exhorting them to continue in the faith through much tribulation. We can imagine this young girl's time out in the field being quite trying and strenuous. And finally, note this bit um, at the end of the verse, she tarried in the house. And um, some translations, I think it's the RV, may, may say something more like without resting even for a moment. But we remember from 1 Kings 7, um, Solomon's temple, one of the two pillars, it's called Boaz. Um, so the pillar being strong with the name of Boaz supports the building, the house of God. Um, first Corinthians three. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So God's building of people, this, this ecclesia, obviously, the, the house of Boaz, the pillar. And 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the ecclesia of the living God, 
the pillar and ground of the truth. So this is where she would tarry, if at all, for reprieve from this work of, of gospel gleaning, the house of Boaz. So coming into verse 8, we find she's, uh, she's told to not go um, to any other field. Uh, as we know, we should uh, stay with that one we have in Christ, you know, his being Israel's, the hope of Abraham, Isaac, Israel. Which again, this abide here is the same cleave word we had back in, in chapter 1, cleaving unto Naomi. Her faithfulness now, um, she's only working in Christ's field. Not turning back like like Orpah types that that may go to another field. First um, John two twenty four. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. We remember Boaz asked, "Whose damsel is she?" Um, and damsel is the same word as uh, maidens here. It's just it's just the singular instead of the um, plural. She was identified as Moabitish and basically not of his maidens. Yet now, once he's heard this report of her character that she's cleaved to Naomi, she's Naomi's daughter, adopted. He calls her my daughter, and to remain among my maidens. He's kind of inviting her to be of Israel, which was not Israel, my people. So calling her a daughter alludes again to the spiritual kind of headship and the responsibility of it that we find Boaz starting to take on. In Psalm 45, as we read, it's is all about Solomon and his marriage to a bride of, of royalty and likely, um, it's 1 Kings 3, I think, likely the Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, which would have been a Gentile. And we start at verse 9 of Psalm 45, um, and speaking of the king, truly is Christ, and, and he starts with this plural. The king's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of rock gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. So Ruth finds herself amongst these, daughters of the king, virgins. And like those of Revelation 14, 4, she is a Gentile and yet called by the king, my daughter. Just as with Naomi, she's adopted. And by Boaz's consideration, she's similarly treated as Israel included with the rest of my maidens. Uh, again, with the type in Solomon, uh, in, the, in the book of, of Song, Song of Solomon, uh, 1 verse 5, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. And it says she's black. And it's almost like this outcast of the daughters of Jerusalem. And even further in, in the Song of Solomon, the next couple verses, she's despised by the children of her mother, but as you read through that book of songs, all her focus is on the king. And verse 9, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So Boaz guides her, you know, let thine eyes be on the field. Focus on the task. And the exhortation to us is obvious to, to, to lay aside the temporal and earthly concerns, to not stray our gaze to any other field. And Philippians 3 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And another thing we see with verse 9 is this well of water. And it's kind of this 
open invitation from Boaz to drink from the water, which she did not draw, um, but the young men. So she didn't do that work. Christ's offering of water to those like Ruth that do the labor and work, but are still thirsty for life. And in chapter 22 of the Apocalypse, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the ecclesias. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, then take the water of life freely. And to take of the water of life freely, the, the Greek is undeserved. It's the same like used in John 15, 25. They hated me without a cause. There's no reason. So she can help herself to this water of life that's drawn by another because of her other labors. And uh, it's the same Amos 8 reference that we already looked at in, in the last class um, regarding the famine, uh, the famine of the word. And it talked about the thirst of his young men and virgins. We see both of here with Boaz, his, his young men and his maidens. However, in contrast, though, these are not in famine. They clearly have plenty of water that's provided by him. It's his well. As he's given the command. He's given the license to drink from it. He owns it. In John 4, um, the water he provides, you know, represents life. Everlasting life, and this is the uh, this is the reference where Christ is um, he's talking to a Samaritan woman um, to draw from the well, and the count uh, the account uh, and other verses from it really fit nicely as we come into kind of this next verse um, in Ruth verse ten. Um, then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? that thou shouldest take, us, take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. So she's asking Boaz why, obviously, take interest in her. And again, the Samaritan woman from John 4, starting at verse 7, there cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So again, why me? Same question as Ruth. Thou a Jew, me a Samaritan, me a stranger. And really in asking the question, really she's answering it. The humility. Why grace, as it says in Ruth, in the, in the verse in Ruth? Uh, and for starters, we start to see it in James 4, verse 6. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So we see Ruth fell on her face. As it says there, it's obviously an expression used uh, throughout Scripture of this humble submission. And she's amongst a pretty great echelon of, of men that, that likewise fell on their face. Abraham did, Moses did Joshua, David, Ezekiel does many times. Um, women like Abigail, the disciples, those that are healed of Christ. And lastly, even the master himself uh, in the garden before Yahweh. It's Matthew 26, 39, where it says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father. So if our, you know, he, our Lord and master, does that, we also ought to do the same. He's an example to do as he has done, uh, to humble, humble ourselves. So she asked the question, why me? And we started to kind of draw out bits of her character, her humility, her, her labor. But now we have uh, Boaz's own explanation himself um, that he gives in verse 11. And Boaz answered and said to her, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. 
and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. So what's been showed him, what does he see? Her treatment of Naomi, the Israel of promise, and her separation. The warning throughout scripture is often not to take daughters of Gentiles as they are a product of their former life. Uh, Numbers 25.1, I have it here. It's uh, in Israel, Bowden, Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And these are Moab specifically. Yet Ruth here deliberately left her father and mother, her nativity. And this is attractive to the master. Psalm 45 again, it's Solomon and Christ, reading at verse 10. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. O forget thy people, thy father's house, and he'll desire thy beauty, just as Boaz does. And Solomon, again, in the book of Songs, chapter 7, I am my beloved, and his desire is toward me. In chapter 4, thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. And finally, Ephesians 5, um, verses 25 and 27, as Christ also loved the ecclesia, that he might present it to himself a glorious ecclesia, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So the ecclesia without spot, this, this is the master's desire um, towards his bride. And this is just a uh, step back view, I guess, of chapter two, um, where I've highlighted all the kind of sights and the focus of these two. Um, in verse nine, he tells her to focus on the field, the work, you know, with thine eyes. Yet immediately in verse 10, we find her focus is all on him and asking why thine eyes, his eyes are focused on her, taking knowledge. You get this, this intimacy between the two of them. It's quite lovely. Um, she went to find grace in verse two uh, in someone's sight, and she's finding it in his, verses uh, 10 and 13. Esther 8, 5 says, If I have found favor in his sight, and the things seem right before the king, and I be, uh, and I be pleasing in his eyes. And you can almost imagine Boaz here, going about his work through the day, he's on the field, but he's always keeping his eyes on her, watching out of the corner, checking in on her. And it's this uh, comforting exhortation to us of the master's care and interest. Um, Psalm 33, verse 18, Behold, the eye of Yahweh is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. And it's interesting enough, Ruth is being supported here from a famine of bread. Uh, and the final note, uh, all this interest of Boaz for Ruth, uh, we see is initially based on a report, right? What he's heard of her um, from his right-hand man in verses uh, 6 and 7, and from others in verse 11. But, as it says, it hath fully been showed to him. Uh, about her. He sees it. And uh, the last thing with this verse, verse 11, we, are, we already looked at Deuteronomy 23. Um, the reasons Israel's not have, uh, is supposed to not have anything to do with uh, Moab um, and to not allow them in the congregation. And one of those reasons is because they, through Balaam, had Israel cursed. Instead, though, with Ruth, a Moabitish, we find the opposite. She has blessed Naomi, and she does bless Naomi. It's, it's known, it's talked about of others, what she's done unto Naomi. Um, we'll find proof of this even further in the book. Um, moving on, though, to verse 12. Yahweh recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of Yahweh, God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. So her work is commended here. Uh, and we already saw this uh, 
The law had provisions for those who kind of matched Ruth's resume really to a T, but instead she works hard providing for herself, just as we should. The old exhortation uh, that it's not of our own works, lest we should boast. And so we find, um, we find Boaz does leave extra wheat for her to glean, showing that she has a reliance. She isn't providing for herself, but that it's God's work. Yet that, uh, that doesn't give license for us to sit on our hands, as they say. It's, it's a principle of temperance, an honest understanding, just like we find with Paul in Romans, um, for example, where he's, you know, we should do this thing. And then you get the rhetorical, does that then mean this? God forbid, far be it. No, we can't, you know, the flesh wants to swing to these extremes as it, as it wants to do. Um, you know, achieving my own salvation by law versus sinning that grace may abound. And Ruth is this perfect example that we must work, but that we must realize in humility in the end, Boaz and, and truly Yahweh provides. So 1 Corinthians 15 reassures us, says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So now uh, these wings of Yahweh's that the Boaz highlights um, that she's come under. Uh, the word trust here, it's the same uh, word for refuge in Psalm 57.1, um, which reads, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Um, so her refuge is in Yahweh. Um, and, and Boaz is, is pointing out, he's, he's noting that she confides in Yahweh, the God of Israel. Exodus 25 um, is the reference that describes the Ark of Testimony. Uh, as we have a little, it's a really little picture there um, with the mercy seat and the, and the cherubim that kind of cover it with their wings. And you can see from the picture, the wings are over the rest of the ark. It really highlights this grace above a, a foundation of law. But by the law, this man, Boaz, would have nothing to do with, with the Moabitess. Instead, now, though, he's wishing Yahweh's mercy on her. Uh, recompense for her work, as he says. That's based on the spirit of the law. So grace over the law still yields good works. We know it's not a, a once saved, always saved situation. Um, and the last thing we'll note here with the wings is they're the same word as skirt uh, that's used later in Ruth 3 verse 9. Um, with regards to the figure of, of atonement with Boaz that we'll get to further in, in the next chapter. Um, but here he's identifying her covering um, being with Yahweh. Now I find Ruth's humility even more manifested here in verse 13. Then said, uh, then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. So Ruth calls him Lord, just as Sarah does Abraham, whose daughters we are. That's pointed out to us in Scripture in, again, First Peter 3. And we already looked at that. Um, talking about the meek and quiet spirit. And as the disciples call Christ, um, John 13, 13, ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. Um, and as we know, we take kind of a good lesson from this in following Ruth's example with that meek spirit before our head, our master. And she has no high consideration of herself, as we, as we saw in verse 10 as well. She highlights, though, um, here his gentleness towards her, that he spoke friendly. And you kind of think of her name's meaning, but the word has to do with the heart, read mind, or understanding so his care for her that's based on kind of real mental considerations 
uh, expressed well in the previous verse, a full reward be given thee. As 1 Peter 3 continues to highlight in verse 7, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And we know from Ephesians 5, the, the great mystery of this is Christ and his ecclesia, the bride. He's giving honor unto a much weaker vessel than himself, which uh, Yahweh willing will be our position as we, as we stand before him at his coming. She calls him Lord, but he feels friendly towards her. It's all about that um, point of view. She's not proud. She doesn't set herself up by his side. She takes the low seat as it was. He's the one to see her as friend and to treat her as such. It's a beautiful relationship that speaks to kind of our approach to Christ. And so Fidelity Boaz offers her uh, to join for the meal. Boaz said unto her, at mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and he reached her parched corn and she did eat sufficed and left so he's extended uh, the offering to now come to his table and even sit beside the reapers as, as scripture highlights to be amongst them uh, the reapers as we previously found being of christ's followers his disciples those laboring in his field and she's now considered amongst them invited to join in the uh, in the supper you know, meal time as it says uh, which brings our minds to that memorial supper it's figured with bread, which we do have here, and wine, which we have in the in the vinegar that's being dipped in. Uh, the same with both Boaz and the Lord Jesus. Um, it's a, a beautiful emblem that we take part in now, but but one which really foreshadows when we can drink it new with Christ in his Father's kingdom. Luke twenty two thirty, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. We find Ruth being accepted into this household, taking place at the table, this Moabitess eating with Jews. Um, verse 14 also uh, says he reaches her this, this parched corn. So this is still being kind of in the midst of harvest time and likely towards the beginning. Ruth 1.22 records the beginning of barley harvest. As we'll look at in more detail a bit shortly um, with that harvest, uh, this parched corn is likely barley grain. As, as we know, corn, when we read it in our Bibles, it's not like the thing we think of today. Um, it's just referring to grain. So we can remember when the disciples, they, they're, they're plucking the ears of corn and they're rubbing them in their hands. It's not actual uh, corn husks um, that they're rubbing their hands um, to eat. That, that corn was obviously discovered uh, when the Americas were. Uh, they're rubbing together um, kind of in this micro scale fashion. They're threshing and separating the, the, the fruit, the grains, uh, as you can kind of see them there in that picture. Um, from the rest of the stock, um, separating them from the chaff. And, and then they're just eating these, these handfuls as, the, as they walk along. And if we remember from Leviticus 23, we looked at the, the feast and what each signified. Uh, the feast of first fruits would take place at the beginning of harvest, being barley harvest. And we know from 1 Corinthians 15, I have it on the screen, that the, the first fruits type Christ's resurrection. In verse 14 from Leviticus 23, um, regarding this first fruits offering, it says, And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that they have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So the parched corn wouldn't be extended or reached to Ruth till the first fruits were offered, until the resurrection of Christ. Uh, is accomplished. So now she can partake in this meal following his first fruits. But now in Christ Jesus, he who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And Acts 26, 23, have it on the slide, says that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people 
and to the Gentiles. Uh, next, verses uh, 15 and 16, when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So Boaz is concerned uh, that Ruth is getting enough food. We see the same, of course, with Christ, Matthew 15, verse 32. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And further, uh, 1 Timothy 5, If any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So Christ, of course, will provide uh, for those of his own house. And he tells him in Ruth um, to not reproach her, to not rebuke her, um, which because Romans 2, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly. She's of this household of God, as we saw already. She's joining the table with the disciples. Um, and as Ephesians 2 says, uh, just reading there on the slide, in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father, now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And we also see from these verses the, the, the scraps are purposefully left. As Boaz says, let fall of purpose, leave them for those strangers and Gentiles uh, that, that, that seek to be fed. Um, one of the best cross-references for this whole chapter, really, is Matthew 15. I'm sure we're all really familiar with it. Um, it's a woman of Canaan. We read Gentile. Uh, she seeks healing for her daughter from the master, and she even calls him Lord. we got it highlighted there multiple times. And we get the famous, it's not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And uh, children being those of Israel, and dogs being um, an unclean animal, uh, per the law, uh, and one that's really looked down on throughout Scripture, and figuring the unclean Gentiles. And, of course, her response, um, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So she doesn't deny what he says. It is Israel's bread. It is their hope. Yet she's going to glean the crumbs that fall from Christ's table, uh, from her master's, her Lord's table. So the humility of this Gentile is mirrored many, many times in the gospel record that by others that, that don't feel that they can enter his roof or join at his table, um, just as we saw Ruth invited to do. Luke 7 is a good example, the Roman centurion. And I'll just read it. I have it here. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servants shall be healed. And what Boaz has them do, dropping some on purpose, um, as it says, gleaning amongst the sheaves, that all goes beyond what the law required. You can see that in Deuteronomy 24. It was only those sheaves that were accidentally forgotten um, in the field that they were to gather. And this is just as Christ does uh, for his bride. Verse 17, she gleans until even. And previously, verse 7, uh, she started from the morning and continued. So she's been out there all day. You can imagine 
uh, it was a 12 hour day for this girl, kind of following Christ's example in John 11. And the, uh, the exhortation for us is to redeem the time, as Ephesians 5, 16 says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And Ruth's example is really um, a, a lesson in endurance, in holding fast unto the end. As Hebrews 3 says, but Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So our steadfast faithfulness, the perseverance in the truth, while we're in this kind of temporal now, today, as it says, or this day, the Hebrew implies this very day. Now, uh, I know Brother Garth kind of has covered this in the past with this group, so we don't kind of have to uh, belabor this. But the word of God um, she's gleaning now needs to be beaten out, as the record says. Whatever we glean must be mulled over, meditated on, studied out. You can't just hear it from another and then and then carry on with your life. It takes a personal sweat and labor to rightly divide the truth. And, and fittingly, in our case, this beating is the same word threshing in Judges 6.11. So that's what Ruth's doing. She's threshing what she gleaned, beating out the grain from the chaff, dividing the truth. And know how in 2 Timothy 2, it also says... A laborer, as we've seen Ruth doing, as we should do, right? Likewise, we even got a little picture there of uh, kind of the physical effort that the that the threshing required. It's a very clear principle. Um, I think it was uh, Brother Lane Rittmeyer. I heard a talk of his on on Ruth, and he had some nice comments regarding this. But uh, the word sheaves. Uh, appearing in this chapter, it's the Hebrew Omer, um, Exodus 16, uh, regarding Israel gathering the manna in the wilderness. It says, gather of it every man according to his eating, an Omer for every man. And the word gather, it's the same as glean. So they were to glean one Omer of manna, an equivalent uh, sheaf for Ruth. And later in Exodus 16, verse 36, it points out there's 10 Omers in an ephah is what we have Ruth gathering here at the end of the day, an ephah, 10 times as much as was to be gleaned with the manna. You can kind of compare that to uh, Malon and Chilion who wasted 10 years. Uh, Matthew 13, verses 11 and 12, uh, I'll just read it. He answered and said to them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. So Ruth is ten times over taking in this word from heaven, uh, which is what we have with the manna, Deuteronomy 8, 3. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Yahweh. And Psalm 78, and it rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. And lastly, Brother Lane uh, did point out how this ephah is like the ecclesia, a, a multitude of the omer, a gleaning of people. Um, continuing to verse 18, she took it up and went to the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. Um Sufficed, being full or satisfied, as it means. So the truth will suffice us. We have this kind of, a, I always think of it kind of like a privileged position to sit back and observe the world around us and see the lack in it, the lack of satisfaction. It's never enough. More, more stuff and activities, chasing some sort of purpose or reason. 
it's, it's chaos really until the day of death. The, the, the flesh is insatiable. It's never satisfied. And how blessed we are with, with this hope of Naomi's. As, as Proverbs 13, uh, 25 says, the righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. Uh, we also see Ruth provides food for Naomi. Romans 15, um, we find the Gentile believers are providing for Jerusalem. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. And it's this mutual uh, benefit, you know, this mutual beneficial relationship where uh, Naomi's bringing a spiritual hope and Ruth is carnal food. Uh, again, we return to the Moabitish or a Moabitish. In Deuteronomy 23, the other reason that a Moabite was not to enter into the Ecclesia, because they met you not with bread. And yet again, in direct contrast, Ruth does feed Naomi. She gave to her. And later in chapter 3, we'll find beautifully at the hand of Boaz, she never comes home to Naomi empty. It's always with bread. Uh, next we'll read uh, verse 19. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And wrought uh, to, to, to make or work with, she works with a man named Boaz. And we've already talked about that pillar uh, named Boaz in, in, in Solomon's temple. Uh, but this one we'll actually read from 1 Kings 7 and what the scripture has to say about it. 1 Kings 7, 21. He set up the pillars in the porch of the temple and he set up the right pillar and called the name of it uh, there of Jachin. And he set up the left pillar and called the name there of Boaz. And upon the top of the pillars was lily work. So was the work of the pillars finished. Um, and nicely, that lily work on the top of the pillar, the, the work is the root word of rot we have in Ruth. Um, and I'll just read it here, Song of Solomon 2, verse 2. Um, but it's a, a, a quick study, really, of lilies. We'll yield this, we'll yield this huge connection between, um, between Solomon, as we have his temple here, for example, and that flower, between Solomon and his bride. So uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, as the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. This lily wrought upon the top of the pillar, uh, the pillar that's named Boaz, beautifully types the, the support of the Lord Jesus and his ecclesial bride, holding her up as a, uh, as a foundation and a cornerstone. And I just listed a few excerpts here from Ruth that kind of portray this. He provides and supports her. Um, finally, verse 20, we come to the kinsmen. Again, we'll get into this uh, much more as we come into chapters 3 and 4, Boaz being the kinsman redeemer. So in verse 1, the word kinsman, as we already touched on, has to do really purely with the family relation, whereas when we come to verse 20, it's the Hebrew goel from gaal, the verb. It's the same Hebrew letters. Um, and it's more so to do with redemption, as the word gets translated, redeemer. And it's like this payment from debt, buying back. We're sold under sin, Romans 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And just have a little quick table on the right there that kind of lays out all the occurrences of the word in, in the book of Ruth. I think there's like 21. So it's really obviously a major theme of this book. And one of our next kinsmen, as Naomi says, implies that there's others, which we'll again find at the end of chapter 3 and into 4. There definitely was another. And I mean, last, we can notice here that this progression downward, you got that blue arrow there, um, this progression downward in familiarity. 
uh, from not really knowing, just hearing of the relative versus one and three, one of Elimelech's kin or family, the kindred of Elimelech, to the approach neighbor, you know, near of kin, as we come into verse 20, to finally the kinsman redeemer, Goel, a closeness, a closeness that, uh, that Naomi is describing, which brings us here to um, this kind of interesting aside. Ruth, Ruth just gives the name of the man in verse 19. The man's name, Boaz. Uh, so like the Samaritan woman at the well, which we looked at, who knewest not who he was that talked with her, that he was the true Messiah. And surely we're brought into the name of Christ at baptism, as, as it says in Acts 2, again, the, 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 the Pentecost. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And the name of Jesus Christ is a central point as we continue on through the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we have life through his name, John 20, 31 says. Uh, so all Ruth had was a name uh, to start with. And by this name, she's on this path to redemption, coming through that kind of process of familiarity uh, to the kinsman redeemer just as the promises identify him. And from 2 Timothy 2, you can uh, see it on the slide there, the, the seal for those in the name of Christ is that the Lord knoweth them. Uh, and as we found through this chapter in Ruth, Boaz knows her. He's heard of her, that she's come out of Moab to be with Naomi and to be with Naomi's people. And uh, like three verse verse four, the disciples of Christ, Naomi and Ruth are now saying the same thing of Boaz. Blessed be he, uh, this named man of Yahweh. Second Thessalonians one, uh, verses 11 and 12. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God, we count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ being glorified. Blessed be he. And Ruth the Moabite said, he said unto me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. Um, so it's my Boaz's harvest. And again, just have a few uh, New Testament references shown there. They're all about Christ, my barn, his angels, his kingdom, his floor, his garner. You know, the gospel news is, is the kingdom of God and the, and the name of Jesus Christ. Truly, this harvest is his. Uh, and as such, his harvest is filled. Uh, we shouldn't stray from it. Um, as Naomi rightly advises Ruth, not in any other field. Verse 22, and Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. Uh, and the hope of Naomi is, as it said in verse 20, for the living and dead. Um, so we see God will deal kindly with um, Elimelech, Malon, Kilion. The people of Israel will be redeemed. Psalm 130, Israel's hope. Let Israel hope in Yahweh. For with Yahweh there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Naomi's hope for Ruth is also redemption with Boaz. She again calls her my daughter here. Um, Romans 9, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Uh, Naomi, like Sarah, um, bearing children of promise, uh, the Israel after the spirit, Hosea's Ami and Rahama here, we find, is what she's calling her, uh, her adopted daughter, my people, beloved. 
And it's ultimately what we're called by the, uh, by the Abba Father, my daughter, your, your adopted in, beloved, obtainer of mercy. There's this very lovely adoption that we have. Um, Lamentations 3, verse 26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of Yahweh. Um, it is good to quietly wait, which is what Naomi and Ruth do uh, coming into this last verse. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean into the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwell with her mother-in-law. And as we already looked at Ruth's uh, perseverance, her persistence, and again, just a list of references kind of highlighting her cleaving, abiding, steadfast, keeping fast, really the, the faithfulness of Ruth. And as we see here in verse 23, that she truly did keep fast through till the end of, bar, uh, of the harvest. <clears throat> mm, another thing we find here, uh, she's settling down really with Naomi, um, living with her. And it's, it's specific to point this out, uh, the same word dwelt, it appears many times in the prophecy of uh, Zechariah, for example, uh, regarding Jerusalem, being inhabited, being dwelt in, being, as it were, filled. And we remember that's in contrast with Naomi uh, from chapter one, being left empty. So this is a time we look forward to when new Jerusalem is full and shall be safely inhabited. And we, and we look to, as Ruth did, be of those that dwell with her and abide there. So the last bit we'll look at is the is the focus on the, this, this focus on the harvest that we kind of see throughout here, and I think it was uh, Brother Terry last time that that mentioned the last verse of chapter one, where it says the beginning of barley harvest, um, and that being the Passover, uh, which is what we've started with in chapter two. It's the start of the harvest season, uh, which is in fact when the Passover takes place. And you have a reference there, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It typifies the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And then really, we have, um, after that, the harvest season, which is what uh, verse 23 says, she's keeping fast through the harvest season, until, as the verse says, the end of barley and wheat harvest. Uh, or the Pentecost from Acts 2, uh, as we'll see the, the time for Christ and the gospel to be proclaimed. And I think uh, one of these charts, you know, just visually seeing it really helps kind of clear things up. I don't know if it's big enough on the screen here, but this is the Jewish calendar, um, you know, for the year. They've got it overlaid with our Gregorian calendar, you know, the one we're used to using. Uh, and as you can see here towards the right, where we've got the upper kind of blue arrow, this is their first month, Abib, which is around, the, you know, the early springtime, March, April. And you can note the Passover pointed by that arrow is the 14th of Abib. And so that, as we reference, typifies the crucifixion of the Lord. And then below that, you can see the first fruits, which took place um, – whichever day it ended up being, the, the, the first day of the week after Passover. So like our calendar, their, their dates shift with the days each year. Um, but for all intents and purposes, first fruits took place just a few days after. Um, I guess one might say around three days after uh, Passover. And so fittingly it typifies the resurrection of the Lord. Um, and next you can see all the dashes kind of below that. There's seven of them. There's seven increments. Um, they're each seven days long. And that's the Feast of Weeks, as it says. And I got the bit of math there uh, on the right. Uh, and I'm sure we can all handle it. It's uh, seven times seven. It's a week of weeks, or 49 days total. Uh, that ends with the Pentecost, or the 50th day. As, as Penta, it's Greek, five. You can think of Pentagon. You know, five sides. Uh, I think for us in America, you can think of the building, five-sided building. 
So Pentecost, which figures, um, as we've looked at multiple times already, the gospel, the news of Christ and his kingdom going forth, spreading out. And then if we kind of clock around through the rest of the summertime they have, about the 8 o'clock of this, we come to trumpets and then the Day of Atonement. And these typify the second coming of Christ and the judgment. And as you can kind of see with little pie slices, that's the end of the grape and fruit harvest. And lastly, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, just above that, the, the Feast of Booths, as it's also called, when we have the kingdom established and Yahweh tabernacles with his people. And one last thing to note uh, before we move on, uh, just going back to the Feast of Weeks side, you can see that all takes place during the barley and wheat harvest. That's the time that we're at with Ruth uh, in chapter 2. It was the beginning of barley harvest. You're going to read post-death and resurrection unto the end of barley and wheat harvest. Read Pentecost. Um, uh, here's basically that chart in uh, text form, I guess. Uh all those feasts coming from the law um, are really summed up pretty well in Leviticus 23 on the right there. And then on the left, we've got all the information that I really just plagiarized from HP, which, which we did look at already uh, towards the beginning of these slides. So we've got Pentecost and gleaning both highlighted there. And Brother Mansfield does know uh, about the gleaning that it would normally commence um, immediately after Passover. So that Feast of Weeks time. But, however, in the Leviticus account, as you have on the right, it follows after Pentecost. And so in the type, you know, the opportunity for Gentile gleaning comes after the Acts to Pentecost. And after the Jews had, had turned from it. And really this gleaning is in conjunction with the Pentecost. When, when the gospel is proclaimed starting first at Jerusalem and then spreading out spreads out to Asia Minor, Rome, you know, the, the known world. It's this spring of harvest. Uh, so we know at Pentecost, Acts 2, they did harvest about 3,000 souls. We just read it recently, I think, in the readings. Uh, and we have there uh, Peter's proclamation to Jerusalem, verses 38 and 39. Uh, and the promise, as he says, to those of Israel and then extended to those afar off, just as we see in Ruth. In verse 42, like Ruth, they continued steadfastly, which we find she does, looking at verse 23 again, gleaning unto the end of harvest and kept fast by the maidens uh, with that work that whole time. This Feast of Weeks, the time of harvest, as is, is Deuteronomy 16 points out, was a time of rejoicing as well as a time of hard labor. Um, I'm sure any farmer would tell us it's, a, it's an exciting time. And as we've seen uh, with the example of Ruth, it's a lesson for us to glean now with the, uh, with the proclaiming of the truth in our own personal study and working it out, our own salvation, which um, coincidentally we're in that time now, actually, you know, the end of, of the grain harvest, it's, it's April, May. So as we come into that, let's meditate uh, as we literally come into this time of, of, of work and rejoicing that we may redeem the time and kind of put our hand to the sickle of, of spiritual things, to the threshing out the good grain. Um, reading Deuteronomy 16, we find Ruth specifically amongst those that rejoice. It says, stranger, fatherless, widow, We'll just read it here. Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 11. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto Yahweh thy God with a tribute of a free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto Yahweh thy God according as Yahweh thy God hath blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice before Yahweh thy God. Thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite that is within thy gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you. 
in the place which Yahweh thy God hath chosen to place his name there, uh, which ends up being Jerusalem and bears his name. And really, ultimately, it is about Yahweh and, and God manifestation. And so God willing at the uh, kind of end of this literal summer, if, if the master remains away, we'll, we'll get to the third class in chapter three of Ruth.